Uh, I just wanted to talk about some of my older, um, somewhat failed uh, inventions that I'm not focusing on or think are too important. Um, and in general, uh, I want to talk about my experience with inventing. Um, specifically, the first thing I ever invented was in middle school. It was a three-flavored soda can that I had made for a project. Uh, basically, I used an empty metal can and a straw in the center and some cardboard to make a, a top that had a, a triangle slice in it that could rotate around so you could drink whichever of the three flavors you'd like. And I've actually seen some variations of that uh, in the last few years uh, from China or something where it's not pre-packaged drink, but it's like a... Um, a water bottle that has three separate compartments, pretty much similar to, to my concept. Um, another one I had in, in 2019 was a um, <clears throat> a basically a portable cooler. Uh, I know that they, they exist, just like a cooler that has a battery pack that can maintain a temperature. But I was specifically um, messing with aerogel, the lightest solid, uh, because of its uh, R rating, uh, just like insulation has, a, has one. Um, I believe that you could maintain a temperature, that there would be no real uh, heat loss or gain in any significant direction, um, just by having a, a small uh, rechargeable battery in it that depending on what you're actually cooling or keeping hot, um, could last for, I, I think, a little bit over a week on a single charge with a single small battery. Um, the concept being that it would um, have a temperature gauge in the inside of the box, and once it got to that temperature, it would mean whatever, whatever you set it to be, if you want it to be cold or hot, it would just apply a small amount of current to a uh, peltier um, panel uh, that can create ener um, heat differences with electricity and it can use that to maintain the temperature. Um, this ultimately never... I, I built a few prototypes with uh, styrofoam and um, had some uh, electrical components hooked up and did some electrical engineering to, to play with the concept. And I found that I wasn't able to get the temperature lower than, I wanna say around 30 or 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And um, I think that would be suitable for a lot of uh, applications, but I just didn't, <clears throat> Uh, didn't have access to the aerogel. I did find some websites on um, those Chinese marketplaces like Alibaba and I um, can't think of the other one, but they only sold them in packs of 10 or 100 or something um, to even mess with a prototype that was a, allegedly an aerogel fabric, which I was also just skeptical about. Um, in my, my concept would be, you would basically have a mold um, in which you would pour an aerogel or create an aerogel barrier uh, in the size of whatever you need and then uh, seal it up and apply or have the uh, thermoelectric component to maintain the temperature and keep track of it and give readouts saying, oh, we can maintain this temperature for two weeks. Uh, with our current battery charge and percentage and as long as you don't open it or something like uh, changes uh, and it would essentially should be able to withstand external temperature changes um, even significant ones like if you were to leave something in uh, your car on a hot sunny day at the beach or something you know it can usually get into like 110 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or more in the car and um, I believe that with the proper insulation with aerogel um, and keeping it maintained with a slight electrical charge or to, to regulate it, uh, you could safely keep your electronics, your medicine, 
um, whatever whatever you need uh, to keep cool. Um, this isn't for food, by the way. I, I just want to make that clear. This isn't for like, oh, I just need to keep my sandwich cold. This is for actually like making sure your laptop doesn't fry, your cell phone doesn't fry, your medicine doesn't go bad or melt or get all over the place. Um, and I just kind of put this one on the back burner. Um, and in general, I think aerogel is really special and really important. And I've been researching several different concepts and ways of creating it. <clears throat> some of them are with vacuums, some of them are, um, there's a lot of different techniques and depending on your your uh, budget and other things uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it and uh, I was considering um, if I were ever to have enough money to get an RV or mobile vehicle like that I would um, modify it to have aerogel insulation in the walls and uh, just custom modifications to it uh, so that it in theory, it would need almost no electricity or air conditioning or heating to maintain a stable temperature in, in the thing um, because I'm out here in Colorado and they have, uh, you know, if I were to go out to the mountains or camping or anything like that in a remote area, you know, they can drop to negative 15 uh, overnight. And I want to test the concept of without using a heater or anything if just my internal body heat and the temperature inside the vehicle with the aerogel um, insulation would allow um, you, you to survive comfortably without external um, heat or electrical sources. Um, I also want to talk about, uh, this is around 2006 to 2008. I was living with a Mormon family in Florida and uh, I was doing a lot of entrepreneurial stuff there. They were into like multi-level marketing uh, a lot. Uh, they were or pyramid schemes uh, it, it, and I don't even want to call them schemes because they were somewhat legitimate in that you know uh, you sell something to somebody and you get a commission and then if you get somebody else to sell those things you get a commission off their commission and it just kind of trickles down um, so if you're into it and you can convince a lot of people you know it's uh, pretty lucrative um, they had me doing it with prepaid legal which was um, basically a monthly subscription service where you could get unlimited calls with an, an attorney uh, to talk about things. They didn't represent you. Um, they did offer discounts if you did need services or representation. Um, but essentially, you could just be like, oh, this neighbor's dog is barking at all hours of the night. I don't know what to do. And you could call them up and they'll say, oh, you can do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, here's how to do that. Um, and it was only like $20 a month. Uh, but, you know, with it being a pyramid scheme, it would be like, oh, you need $100 to sign up as a seller, and then, you know, all that, whatever. Um, the good thing about that was it, it definitely taught me several interesting things about marketing and sales and stuff, and it was just a good experience, all in all. Um, but during that time, I specifically remember I was submitting um, inventions to the like 1-800-INVENT uh, numbers that they would play uh, at like 2 a.m. Uh, after the girls gone wild skits. <laughs> and um, I just think it's funny. I, I wanted to bring up some of the variations. Uh, I can't remember all of them. I'd have to dig deeper in my notes. But uh, I specifically remember one I called the Let It Out <laughs> machine. Uh, horrible name. But the concept was... Um, essentially a small room or box that you could go into in a public or uh, work environment to vent your frustrations. Um, the main concept being that it's always playing classical music in the ambient area around it. And then once somebody enters into it, it would have a microphone to just detect the decibel that you're saying or screaming things and then it would match or uh, play classical music on the outside 
of the machine uh, greater than the decibels of what you're able to produce in the machine. Therefore, nobody can actually hear you um, say or scream or cry in any way. And um, all they would just hear is classical music or loud classical music and they'd be, oh, he's having a bad day or whatever. And um, I think it's funny that, uh, you know, I submitted that back in 2006 and then I see articles today that uh, Amazon has these, I don't know what they were calling it, but it was essentially my idea, but without the music, where they were like, oh, here's a little box to scream in, but they just put it in the front of everybody and didn't have any way of masking the sound. So people go in there and they're just screaming and everybody's like, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> and it, it just, it, I hate seeing my ideas uh, tarnished like that. And so like, I don't even want credit or to be a part of that in any way i i just think it's sad that you know i, I put these ideas out there i um, go through these services and, and by the way these 1-800 invent numbers that used to go around in the early 2000s or late 90s uh they were basically a scam too where they were like oh they, they'd have a picture of like a caveman or something oh did you invent something uh call us today and we'll make you rich and i'm like yeah i've got all these inventions and uh, i'd call them up and essentially, um, they'd be like, oh yeah, whatever your idea was, oh, it's such a good idea. Whether it was a good idea or not, they would hype you up. Say, oh yeah, you're gonna make so much money. Uh, all you need to do is give us $1,500 and we'll start you know, developing and writing business plans or, I don't even remember what they offered, but essentially it was like, they didn't do shit. They were basically like, you can pay us and like we'll like maybe get you started or like, I really don't even know how that works to completion or if they get a large cut of it because it's like you're calling them and it was basically scams um, and they basically wanted your money uh, and would trick you into uh, pursuing bringing it to completion uh, and it would just I never even started I never gave them a single dollar uh, I just assumed that after the initial 1500 It'd be like, oh, now we need 10,000 for the patent. Oh, now we need, you know, it would just exponentially grow. And these, um, it was just uh, honestly offensive that they would market it and essentially steal your idea when you couldn't afford to pay for their services, whatever those services were. And then now uh, I'm seeing them around the world in very cheap and knockoff variations of my ideas. Um, it's not even frustrating. I mean, it's actually nice to see some of my ideas come to fruition, even if it's a, a rotten fruit. But, um, you know, I just think it's, it's, uh, I think it's just interesting that, um, you know, I've met a lot of people and, and usually when I share my ideas, they'll be like, oh, I, I have an idea of my own. Like everybody actually seems to have some sort of concept or idea, um, some more believable than others. The uh, people I was living it with in Florida that were doing the multi-level marketing, uh, the one woman claimed she invented the bumper, as in like on cars. And I'm just like, okay. But it, like when she told me this, like cars had already been a thing and had bumpers for a long time. So I'm like, okay. Um, and that's another point is it, I also find it interesting that um, a lot of things that people think need to be invented already definitely exist um the classic example uh is my dad had an idea um i think it was for he, he's a truck driver so he had some sort of uh concept with pallets and uh oh now i remember uh the forklift operators that unload the trucks uh, when they come to dock he said a lot of these places uh they're just uncovered and when you go to use them, you just, if it's raining or whatever, you get soaked and it sucks. And he was like, oh, I want to invent a little uh, overhead attachment unit that you can put onto these existing machines that would provide uh, rain protection and protection from the elements during that time. And he got super excited and we all were like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And he was going to start selling it. And um, I was like, yeah, that, that's great. And then I was like, one of my other friends who's a little bit more savvy with uh, not getting excited about that stuff was like, did you Google 
this yet? And we were like, no. Uh, so we Googled uh, forklift covers, rain covers, and up pops a dozen companies that offer those products at various prices and models. And um, <laughs> it, it, it's just funny because he, you know, in his experience, he was like, you know, I haven't seen a single forklift have a cover like that. Um, or like attachable or removable one that he was trying to sell and he never thought to Google it to see if it existed and I thought that was just fascinating and I, I was made the same mistake many times too um, so I don't want to discourage uh, innovation and inventions but I also it's important to not reinvent the wheel and see what other people have done and considering there's what eight to 10 billion people out here on this planet right now. It's not inconceivable that somebody had uh, thought of what idea you had and has already made significant progress in developing or even bringing it to market already. And, um, I don't wanna say this is discouraging because in my, in my experience, uh, it's more inspiring where you say, oh, this is how they do it, but it's missing a, this critical step that I think would actually make it so much better. And so you might still uh, you might not be inventing the thing itself, but you might have a um, um, alteration or improvement on an existing idea, which is just as valuable and just as important as an original invention itself. Um, thinking of uh, him, I, I wanted to, he had another, this isn't necessarily an invention, um, more of a business idea that anybody can do um, so I'm happy to share this uh, you know also being in the trucking industry like like I had mentioned he had said that there's always an abundance of pallets empty pallets like the wooden things that they keep the and deliver items on and a lot of times these get broken or sometimes they get reused but almost always they get stacked up forgotten or replaced or you have to pay to have them removed or whatever it may be, and uh, he came up with the concept of uh, offering a service where you essentially would just need a box truck or a pickup truck uh, to pick these pallets up. You offer to pick them up either for free or a very uh, low price, and then you repurpose these pallets for uh, an array of different uh, products. Um, the first and most obvious I I've seen people do is they just paint the pallets to look like an American flag or uh, the local sports team or high school team or whatever and or whatever holidays around and they you know market it as that say oh twenty dollars for and it's art um, but that's not the real good use I think that this would be good for um, I think that if you were to collect these pallets and you could have a facility to process them or a yard or warehouse or shed or whatever to, to process that you could uh have some sort of automated machine that would break down and you could feed in the planks of the pallets and it could grind them down to a powder or smaller uh you know and sell it as wood chips uh there's um certain things where uh, they clean, uh, they use wood powder uh, to clean up like oil spills in mechanic uh, car shops. And there's just other uses for it where you can apply certain chemicals to the wooden powder to give it other properties uh, for scientific purposes as well. And essentially you're getting paid to pick up or get your inventory for free. And then you just need to actually process it down and um, Make sure that you know it's of quality or uh, not having various um, impurities depending on what you're actually selling of it and you know there you go just start selling it shipping it um, and this can be done worldwide everywhere has pallets everybody has the ability to go pick one up and turn it into something so i i always liked that concept and that idea and um you know i don't think it's fair to be greedy or uh selfish about the pursuits of um, entrepreneurship and uh, making something out of nothing or trash um, so yeah um, I'm sure I have a few other inventions I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about today 
but I just want to share some of my history and uh, experiences with uh, inventing and concepts uh, and innovation in general. Um, I also want to talk about the poor man's patent. Um, that was a real thing up until I believe like the 19, early 1900s, like 1910 or 20. Uh, essentially the, the idea was uh, if you had an invention and couldn't afford to hire a patent attorney or file a patent yourself, you could uh, mail yourself a letter with your invention and sign it and date it. And the idea being that you could bring that sealed, stamped, processed letter from the post office um, to a court to prove that you invented or had this concept at this time. And they called it the poor man's patent. And I thought that was a real thing, uh, even in 2007 or 8 when I was being told about this uh, in Florida when I was inventing and coming up with some, some different things. And I even, uh, up until maybe four or five years ago, even had that patent, or the poor man's patent. I, I kept that letter for 10 years. Uh, and um, only, I want to say, last year did I actually discover that the poor man's patent isn't a thing anymore. Uh, basically, uh, in the early 1900s, um, a judge or several judges realized that people could manipulate this poor man's patent system by using steam or an iron to uh, open up a sealed letter and then they could put whatever they want or take out whatever they want, uh, add whatever dates they want and then seal it back up and say, oh yeah, look, here's the post office thing, here's the letter, and look, it's sealed. Um, but yeah, it became very clear that this was uh, open to abuse and scammers and uh, they basically abolished that uh, like a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, so since then, uh, I have also done research into real patents and um, the end result is you only need about 80 to to $100 to file a provisional patent, uh, which is essentially a placeholder where you, uh, you submit $80 and the paperwork for your patent to the patent office and they will hold your spot basically saying that we're holding this spot for this invention and patent for one full year and you have that one full year to get the money together the five to twenty thousand dollars you would need depending on what you're actually filing um and and the provisional basically just is a, is a placeholder but it does expire after one year and after that one year anybody can use it if you have not secured it by the end of that year um I was thinking of filing some just to have the paperwork and be like, you know, I don't, I, I don't have the money for real patents. Um, but uh, just for my own ego and um, to show off to others, I, I'd like to potentially have the paperwork or even frame some of my provisional patent ideas um, just for my own satisfaction. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to also specify that um, Hiring patent attorneys to do this for you is also very expensive. You're probably looking at anywhere between twenty and thirty thousand dollars at on the low end to hire a professional to do this for you, and at least five to ten thousand um, dollars to file a patent yourself as yourself, doing all the work and paperwork yourself. So it's pretty prohibitively expensive for. Um, the average person or poor person who's just trying to invent or you know patent a concept to own it uh, which is why sometimes you can partner with venture capitalists or other uh, business and, and other groups that um, support those type of innovations but um, I just want to share my experience with um, with inventions and uh, the process of pursuing them, uh, patenting them, and uh, all that. So, hope you enjoyed this video, and look forward to more.